All right, here's the session. There's not loads of tracks going on on this one. Um, at the very top here, I've got some muted turned off channels. Those are basically when I'm mixing in, or when I'm demoing in Logic, uh, I demo all the tracks, whatever instruments I decide to play in and program in, and then I bounce those down for the recording sessions when I record along, and then I replace each instrument as we go. So you can see I've replaced the drums, I've replaced the bass, I've replaced the keys, and I can probably get rid of these because my mate Jez has since replaced the strings, which I'm going to colour. What should we colour these? Um, and as you can see, there's guitars as well. I don't play guitar, so I need my expert friend David D'Andrade to play those for me. I can't find the colour thing. There we go. So this, the point of doing this is organising the session. I've completely forgotten how to change the colour. Excellent. Colour regions. Oh, show high colour. That's the one. Let's put them as, like... Uh, Let's go for that nasty. No, that's a horrible colour. Let's go for let's go for that nice dark colour. And the vocals as well. Strangely, I like colouring my vocals pink. Don't know what that says about me. Pink is a good colour. Right, so the point of doing this is to organise the session. So I know if I want drums, I'm up here. It makes it a lot easier to navigate. And then what I've done... On the first track I ever recorded and mixed myself, I went in and I mixed each individual microphone on the drums to the nth degree till it sounded good on its own. But what I wasn't really paying attention to was how it sounded in relation to the rest of the kit and, in fact, the rest of the mix. And it also took a lot of time. So I've used an approach, and I have used on many tracks now, an approach called top-down mixing, which is much more efficient. So what you do is basically you import all your tracks you set up the necessary gains on them, adjust that if needed, and you adjust the levels, as you can see I have done here, and in Mixer View as well. You can see all the faders. And those are the levels I want for these instruments. And I haven't done any automation yet. I always save that, to, well, I, I didn't. Now I save that till the end, because that's a nightmare once you start that. So I get all the levels the same or as, as you want them, and then go to the master bus, and then you basically mix from the top. So you mix from the master bus down. And the reason you do this is if you've got all the audio files in your project set up, as I have done now, you can get an overall, an overall idea of how the mix is going to sound. So, for example, I've just added a little bit of compression at the start. I mean, that's barely doing anything. Very low ratio, just to smoothen everything out. I've then gone in with the Fab Filter Pro EQ, which is an incredible EQ. Uh, all the rage about this, all the hype is very valid. Um, I'll let you know about a plugin that I don't think is valid though. Uh, so I've just, you know, tweaked a few bits there, taken a few bits out there just to kind of clear up the whole mix as a whole. And a few of the things, the uh, multiband compressor, I think that's a preset, if I'm honest. It's probably not really doing much. Then a Pultec. I never use more than two, one or two dBs at the low and top end, but this preset, which I've tweaked slightly, is great for mixers. Um, then the UAD Precision, which is a stereo widening EQ, similar to the, uh, there's a Good Waves one. I can't remember what that's called. I'm really hungry, by the way. I've had a long day, so I'm going to try and keep this video short. But if my brain stumbles, it's because I haven't eaten for about seven hours. And uh, finally, the Neve, whatever that is, um, compressor. This, that's quite spectacular. Uh, I played with the Fab Filter Limiter. I haven't quite got my head around that yet. And the Logic Add Density Limiter is good. Tiny bit of final EQ there, particularly that 160. Now, that is a tip from Streaky Mastering, if you follow him. He did a video where he said, cut out 160 and it'll really separate the top and the low end that's just something I did when I was playing around with this mix I haven't really done much to this yet I know it looks like I've done quite a bit but um in the grand scheme of things this is not much uh oh and Stoneworks I should totally turn that off amazing software if you haven't so that is the natural EQ of my speakers in my room at the moment and if I show you the correction Sonaworks is doing the opposite that's the green lines. Looks a bit of a mess. 
Let's get rid of the target. And the simulated after is that flat, per well, nearly flat purple line. So Sonarworks um, is correcting my speakers for the room because it's not an ideal room, which is a bit of a shame as it's my new studio. Uh, right, so once you've done your top-down mixing, I would then split up. That's just to mold the, the entire track into something usable, something that you enjoy listening to. And you have, a, I mean, I've got a couple of levels of compression there. Neither are really doing much. But what you then do is mix into that. So if you over push a channel, you can hear it hitting the the mix, uh, the compressor on the master bus, and then you know to back it off. It's kind of like a an early warning system for not over compressing and not over driving stuff. So I've then gone down and created a drum bus. So I will then create a bus for each instrument. Now, what I've the mistake I've made in this project, because of the way I've done all my tracks, is I've recorded drums in one session, imported uh, drums in one session, slightly mixed that, edited that, and all that stuff. I'll do videos on my process because they're quite involved. Uh, and then I've gone away with a stereo bounce to record the bass in another session, mixed all that, gone away, done a stereo bounce of those two instruments for the guitar session and so on. And then I've gone back to the original drum session and then exported all the other audio files into the drum session, having duplicated it. So I have the original untouched in case anything goes wrong. And then this then becomes my mix project. So that was it. The mistake I've made here is I've imported them, then I've done a drum bus imported the bass and the keys, and then I've done the keys bus, which is why, annoyingly, my drum bus is here, my guitar bus and key bus are there, and I haven't bothered doing a vocal bus yet. I haven't bothered doing a bass bus yet because there's only one channel. I did some mix, uh, three bass channels into one. Um, so I might go back and do that at some point. And then got the guitars i haven't done a string bus yet and i haven't bothered with the vocal bus yet because i need to re-record all these although some of these demo vocals are i quite like them but i've since decided to phrase things a bit better a bit more musically and a bit less drummer reg regimented on the beat um as you'll hear in a bit it's a little bit static um and the vocals i've got I recorded through my V47 microphone. These were done through my V67. And I think actually they sound quite good. This was through my Warm Audio WA73 preamp. Um, and my WA76 compressor into my WA2A compressor. And these sound all right. Now, when I redid the vocals with my V47, because it's quite a high song for me, um, and obviously I'm not the greatest singer, as you guys know, if you've watched the channel before. Um, the V47 just has a bit more low end in it, which is good for the higher registers when typically singers lose their low end. Uh, and I got a good delivery, a good take. I think my pitching was quite good on the day, but I've over compressed it, so I can't really use it. It's, it, it is audible. Um, so I'm going to do it again properly, but that's just a, a great way for me to sing properly let's just check the video is going all right yeah cool all right alexi's in the house hey man good to see you buddy check out alexi's channel uh he does some good plug-in reviews and uh yeah, just check out his channel he's a he's a beast um so we talked about top down mixing and then i bust everything up so i'm gonna select this top channel here now i've set all the levels for the instruments as you can see to my taste then i'm gonna click on the top instrument, press shift, click on the bottom one here, and then go to this icon here, as you can see there, is ungrouped. And I'm gonna click on groups, and if you haven't set any groups up, you can go to new. I've already got a drum group. Go up to this icon here, where the group settings are. Now this section is really important. So this is where you can select the quantize lock and the editing. So what that does, if you're comping multiple instruments, for example, a drum kit, and say you've got 12, I've forgotten how many mics we used on this session, probably about 20, some of them stereo channels. So we've got maybe, uh, what, 17, 18 drum, drum channels there. If you start comping those and you accidentally haven't selected one channel or you've only selected one and not the others, you will have a nightmare editing drums. So grouping them all together and quantize locking them means they'll all be quantized at the same time. Editing them means all the comping and editing is going to be done to all of them at the same time. 
Uh, track alternatives means you're going to be selecting the right alternatives. Automation means you're going to be doing all the automation to all the drums. I wouldn't do that. I would automate the drum bus, but I don't really do much automation for reasons I can explain in another video. Um, and then if you want to adjust the volume, mute, solo, pan, record. Record's a good one for tracking. That's really useful. You can do that. So I will group all the instruments together. So for example, I've done that with the keys as well. And I've done that with the guitars, etc. You get the idea. And then on the drum bus, so I haven't really done any processing. As you can see, kick in, out, nothing, nothing. Oh, okay. What? A, oh, that's a sampled snare that I'm not actually using. Um, that was a trial. I'm trying to avoid samples on this song. Although I am tempted to try the Slate Trigger 2, which I bought in the Black Friday sale and I haven't used it yet. <laughs> Uh, so no, as you can see, right, so there's no process, okay, a bit of overheads and room EQ, but that is it on the drum. So I've not gone in and tweaked any of the channels yet. I've just stuck to bus processing using this top-down approach. Uh, there's a few people. Hey, Rakesh, good to see you guys here. So if you've missed it, we're, we're talking um, top-down mixing, and this is a completely impromptu live stream if you missed the introduction. Uh, I've just figured out um, all my OBS settings and sound settings today. Hopefully everything is all right. Hopefully the sound's coming out of both sides and not just one. That was embarrassing. <laughs> Alexei will remember that one. Um, so what I've done to the drums is just a couple of bits. But before we get to that, why don't we listen to the track? Now, the the... The drums were done at a professional studio at my friend Finn's studio, Summer House Studios. He's since moved studios, but he's got a load of really nice analog gear. Um, so the drums raw sound pretty good, I think. The bass we did in my old studio, in my which was my bedroom. If you haven't seen the uh, big studio reveal video, I pan the camera around from where it used to be with all the um, rubbish grey foam and the orange. It used to look good. I pan the camera around in that video and you can see what's behind the camera, which is no secret was my bedroom. That's quite a funny video. And uh, you get to see the new studio as well as I'm moving into that. Um, so we did bass in my room. My friend Jay did keys. We've done all that remotely. He's got a great setup with some Neve 1084 preamps, I think. And guitar we did through a Captor 1. I can never remember the name. Uh, Captor 1 Torpedo X, the little square box um and i think it sounds great it's 98 percent of the way there to a, an amplifier in a room and my mate david is just a sublime player uh jez has also done some strings for me um so i programmed in and sampled a load of strings he's got better samples and he's a professional string arranger so he did a far better job than i did and then some vocals um which may have been tuned Oh, yeah, so I've got a cheeky pitch correct. They're not too bad, these vocals, for my standard, to be honest. Um, I must have warmed up that day, put it that way. Uh, so why don't we have a listen to the track? Um, just be on your volumes, because this is my first live stream. I think these volumes are okay. I'm hearing what you're hearing, so it should be all right. Let me know if it's too loud. Anyway, we'll have a, a little gander into the track and then um, split up these, uh, go into each instrument and see what I've done. By my side, with tears from heaven, that she cried. I saw reflection in those eyes, like a ghost in the night while we were dancing. Will you take me by surprise? Will you take my breath away? Will you take me by All right, there's a cheeky turnaround there. And uh, I noticed a couple of people dropped off the, the live stream there. Fine, fine. Be like that. I don't mind. I don't, and no, I do need you guys to watch. <laughs> uh, right, so going into the drums, I'm just going to solo the drum bus and I'm going to mute whatever that is, whatever that is, and these. And we're going to listen to those on their own.
So it's, you know, sounds like a kit. Um, it's a pretty good sounding kit. That's my Yamaha hybrid uh, maple kit with Finn's Ludwig Acrylite snare drum, I think, and a combination of Zildjian and Minel cymbals, which sound a little dark, which is wicked. Uh, I think we had ribbons on the overheads for this session. I can't remember. So the first plug-in up is the Loch Ness. Now, what I've noticed is I haven't got the EQ first, which is interesting, and there must have been a reason I did that. Loch Ness plugin is a compressor and a saturator plugin from Tone Empire. If you don't know Tone Empire plugins, they are doing some of the best, if not the best sounding plugins I've heard recently. They are genuinely brilliant. And the installation process is a dream. It is so good. I'm literally telling other companies that they need to get their act together and make it as easy as Tone Empire do. Um, and they're not that expensive. Uh, I think full price, they may be 70 pounds, 70 euros, which I guess is $100, but they often do sales. And unlike one of the other major companies where you buy plugins in a sale, you actually own these plugins for life, which is amazing. Uh, definitely check out Tone Empire. So Crust is our saturation and there's different levels and Smash is a compression. So let's have a listen with and without. quite like that amount of crust and we can go more on the compressor there uh, I've so I've done a little bit of EQ as well this is to get rid of some harmonics and frequencies that are annoying me um, especially that one obviously let's have a listen with and without And what I need to do is test these the other way around because often uh, EQ before compressor obviously really affects how the compressor reacts because it's compressing prominent frequencies. But if you take them out, it's not going to compress those. So you have to adjust the compressor settings and so on. So let's hear them the other way around. I think I prefer it as I had it. Yeah, but I want some of that top end back in. Right, and then I've got the black VEQ, black QV2, which is the version two of uh, their saturator plugin. Again, that's AB. So it's subtle, but the drum bus is the place to be putting subtle um, harmonic distortion like that. And I guess a parallel bus as well, which you'll see in a minute. Um, Toxic MC has a question. What audio interface do I use? Uh, I use predominantly the Apollos from Universal Audio. Um, actually, uh, shout out to Alexa if you're still watching. On his channel, I'm going to be doing a video very soon describing my audio interface setup and how I'm recording drums through my Apollo Twin and my Universal Audio X6 using two Audion ASP 880s. I haven't actually tracked one of my songs in this studio yet. That series of videos is coming. So you get the idea with the drum bus. Um, we're, we're just going for a global overall processing just to tighten up the sound. I will then go into this in more detail later, uh, which will probably be another live stream, hopefully, if this goes well, uh, where I will maybe, I mean, I don't know if the kick drum needs anything. Maybe the kick drum needs a bit of click, a bit of top end. Um, maybe the kick out needs to be tweaked. So that's a bit more of a woolly sound. Uh, the snare drum might need some body and some sharpening maybe, and some more resonance taken out. And the toms, I will probably, go through and manually gate the toms. Uh, I don't really like gate plugins. I just find them so hard to get accurate. Um, and if you don't hit a tom hard enough, it doesn't go through the gate. And then if you do get a good peak and then you also hit a crash cymbal really loud, it'll open the gate and you'll get the ding, 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 you know, the gate opening. I just don't like it. So I just manually gate them. But that is a job I will do and not live stream because that'll be very boring. Um, and a few other things. I think I've done a couple of tweaks to the rooms and the overheads. Talkback mic was an SM57. 
next to me to talk to Finn in the uh, control room. The U87, okay, let's have a listen to these because uh, the U I'm going to have to turn the drum group off, aren't I, for that? The U87 versus the Jay-Z V67. Let's have a listen to this comparison. So both room mics, very low in the mix. Let's just take these both up. What were they at? Minus 25. Not done that very well, have I? Go away. <laughs> yeah, interesting. I might have swapped them around. Okay. Hey, Leon, how's it going, mate? Oh, so that's the difference between the V67, uh, which is my favourite mic of all time, versus the U87, which is a... There's a reason that's one of the most famous mics of all time. I've tried it in the studio. I have AB'd it on vocals. It is incredible. It's so clear and detailed, but the V67 just has a character that's just delightful, as I think you can probably hear on uh, on these two mics there. Right, let's put that back down to minus 20.5. Yeah, hi, Leon. How's it going? Uh, Leon made a really good suggestion um, in my recent video, the Audient versus Apollo video that I did. Um, I can't remember his exact question, but I remember his being a good one. Um, remind me what it was, Leon, <laughs> if you're still watching. Because uh, I had to go and check a few things and then came back and tested it and it was a really good thing to test for the video. Uh, so that's what I've done with the drums and I've also done a parallel, couple of parallel sends. One of them I know is going to be reverb. What have we done here? Uh, okay, so this is where we've used the Wii. I have used the um, FabFilter Pro R. I'm not convinced by this plugin and I know people are going to hate me in the comments. I know it's super flexible and I, I clear, you know, I'm going to blame the user, not the tool, because I haven't spent enough time with it. But I just can't get a sound out of it that I think sounds natural. I know it has its use, um, but so far for me, it's not the one. Not compared to the Valhalla Vintage Reverb, which is incredible. And I've, since doing this session, found some AMS, um, uh, the Universal Audio AMS, uh, what is it? RX-16. Ah, oh, this is a great plugin. That's got some really good uh, stuff in, so I will come back in the mix and probably use that. Uh, you may have noticed that I have a lot of Universal Audio plugins. <laughs> um, Universal Audio have been very kind to me and very supportive, and they've given me a license for a year for all of their plugins. Um, they might not like me saying that online. Too late. Uh, but those guys have been so supportive. They're always on the end of emails if I need any questions answering. Um, just a great brand. Them and Audient are brilliant in that regard. Really good. Other companies are useless in that regard, but those two are brilliant. Uh, so a bit, a little bit of reverb. Let's hear it with the reverb. This is just to thicken out the sound a bit, just to give it a bit more weight. So without the bus, sorry, we're listening to the whole mix here, aren't we, amateur? Uh, without the bus, with, uh, and I've been a complete idiot because I've turned it off. <laughs> what a professional. A true professional never makes excuses. <laughs> They give reasons as to why they're rubbish at the job, like me. Right, and again. Oh yeah, hi Dan, Dan Francis Owen. Go and check out Dan Francis Owen's channel, Real Gig Advice, bridging the gap between university and the professional life and everything in between that they don't teach you at university. How's that for a sale, Dan? <laughs> Big up yourself, mate. Uh, so the, the reverb on the drums is just giving it more room, more space. Now, I've, I've been using the um, Capital Chambers reverb from Universal Audio. And wow, that thing's amazing. I've come up with a really good preset that I'll probably bring into this mix at some point. And the next bus send is a parallel. That's my code for parallels. Two slashes, and I've used a UAD, Empirical Labs, 
distressor and uh, look I've absolutely nuked it so let's have a listen to that um, I'm gonna dial that in let's have a listen and I'll bring it in as we go And I'll have to listen to that in the context of a mix to reassess that. So obviously it's adding another channel of audio, the same audio um, process differently. So it is increasing the overall volume. So you've got to be careful with those not to push the volume too much. But that just gives, it again, just another level of ugh, kind of grit and punch. Great plugin. Um, I, I, I can safely say I will probably never have the original unit because they're quite expensive. Uh, right. And then bass. This, is, this one's for you, Dan. Speaking of you, Dan, I need to get you on one of my tracks, mate. Uh, Leon says it was a difference between the DI inputs. Yes, it was. Um, yep, because uh, actually I was going to leave that out of the video um, because I thought that would be boring. But clearly, if people want to know about it, they want to know about it. So thank you for that. Um, Komodo, hey, man. How you doing, buddy? Uh, Chris is a musician and a drummer, very good drummer, and uh, writes some cool songs as well. Komodo, have you got a YouTube channel? I assume you have because you're online. Uh, right, bass. What have I done to the bass? Let's have a listen to this without any plugins. I can't remember what I've done. Sorry for the clicks, that's annoying. All right, so a bit of compression and a bit of uh, fab filler. Cool. I mean, that sounds like a bass. That is a gentleman called Jack Stevens playing the bass for me there. Um, move on to the keys. All right, so I've grouped all them together. I've done a tiny bit of EQ to each one, mostly high-pass filters uh, and a bit of a peak there to give it some presence at 1K. And the keys bus, let's solo that with and without. Let's find a section where there's actually piano. All right, so the Logic Stock EQ, these are great. These get underrated. These are very underrated, but for linear static EQ, can't go wrong with these. Uh, high pass filter there just to filter out the low end. There's enough going on with the kick and bass. Uh, anything below that on the piano and the keys is just a bit of noise, I think, ambient noise. And a dynamic EQ. Dynamic EQ is your best friend for mixing. Uh, at that, whatever that is, 315, occasionally when it's prominent. So the beauty of a dynamic EQ, and I used, these are amazing on bass, guitars, and keys particularly. Sometimes I use them on vocals. No, I use them on vocals all the time, that's a lie. Um, so let's play this and I'll demonstrate it. So you can see sometimes it moves and sometimes it doesn't. What it's dialed into there is 315 hertz, which is a little prominent to me on its own. So when that, whatever chord or chords are putting out 300, lots of 315 hertz, a dynamic EQ can dip those. And I've only got that set to what, like two and a half dB or something. Um, but just enough just to take that presence off it, just to curtail the sound a little bit. But when the keyboard's not playing those notes that are causing this frequency to resonate. It's not dropping the EQ. If I had a static EQ and I just, you know, pulled that down, for example, it would be taking out that curve at that frequency all the time on all the notes. But if, for example, you know, I'm playing an A chord and it's prominent at 315, Dan's going to laugh at that. Uh, <laughs> And I want to take out 315. If, for example, I get up to a G, uh, A, B, C, D chord, for example, and it's not there, I might, by taking out 315, that might make that chord sound quite thin. Now, this is only a small little EQ, but, for example, if I did a great big cut like that, for example, um, you can hear it in action, actually.
So you can see it's um, pulling down whatever prominent frequencies are there, but only when they're there and when they're prominent. Love dynamic EQs. I do need to do a video on it, uh, but I no longer have my Waves F6 plugin for various reasons. <laughs> um, and guitars, what have I done to the guitars? Nothing. Really? I don't believe that. Ah, okay, so I've treated each guitar individually. Okay, so I've done a little bit of treatment on each guitar rather than doing the top-down approach. Um, I guess because we were using slightly different guitar sounds and tones, uh, drives, gains, um, pickups, and I think we used three different guitars on this track. This is my friend David DeAndrade, one of my favourite people in the world and one of my favourite guitar players. Um, let's have a listen to this Ebo start because I've EQ'd that and put some reverb on. So there's a short reverb there, and then there's a longer one, which I've, a I've actually chained that to the long snare reverb. Have I used a snare reverb? I have. All right. So I did go a little bit further than the top-down mixing on this with the snare reverbs, but I need to get to three reverbs on the snare. Three is the magic number for snare reverbs. One short to give it some body, uh, a longer one with a pre long pre-delay in the background, and usually I go for a gated one as well, depending on how forward in the mix it is, depends on how 80s it sounds. Um, let's just listen to all the guitars because they're great. <laughs> And again, there's no point really listening to the. I mean, these sound good on their own, but the strange thing with guitars is they can sound like I would, if I was listening to those on my own now, and I, it was just those, I would definitely go in and tweak those and mix those differently. But in the mix, they work, and that's what you have to keep in mind when doing this. Now, obviously, if you guys missed the intro, welcome to everyone. There's a few people asking questions. Uh, I'll get to those in a sec. Um, uh, in the intro, this is a really impromptu session. I've just set up my live streaming uh, setup today, so I'm testing it now. Um, and this is just a walkthrough of a session that I've got. This is a track I'm well overdue finishing. Uh, and I thought, why don't I combine a live stream and an actual mix session um, just to do some different videos, see how they go. So that's what we're going to be doing. Uh, let's listen to these strings because these are just magnificent when they kick in. And they're completely dry. I haven't done anything to those. Uh, my friend Jez Davies, uh, he he mixes the sounds roughly to the mix I send him, which was a very <laughs> rough mix of everything you've heard so far, minus the strings and the keys, and he plays to that. Um, he just has such a good ear for tweaking sounds to a mix already. Uh, he sends me dry and unprocessed and processed versions, and I think I've gone for the processed versions with those. They sound great. Now we could listen to the vocals, but nobody wants to do that. Let's have a break and answer some questions. Uh, Vinod, apologies if that's not your how you pronounce your name. Uh, any preamp suggestions for Dynamic Mic SM58? Ooh, uh, SM58 is a classic mic. Um, I have four of those. I've had those for about 15 years since I've been doing live sound. Uh, do you know what? Any preamp? Um, I'm a Fan of the warm audio stuff. I think that's certainly the WA73. I'm really happy with it. It's great above 100 hertz, and it I'm not going to say it sounds like a Neve, but it, it competes um, unless you go below 100 hertz, and then for me, it just does weird things. It's as if the circuits can't handle the low frequencies or the different voltages, I don't know. Um, but it gets a bit strange uh, under 
100 hertz. Um, but can't go wrong with the, the warm audio stuff, I think. I know Heritage Audio is popular. Um, it's like anything with audio. Your sound is going to be is only going to be as good as the weakest link in the chain. So whether that's the microphone or the preamp or the person using it. Uh, Leon has a question. A few days I tried both Neve 1073 and Amec Pure Path CIB with my SM58 and they both sound great. Oh, cool. Answering uh, Vinod's question. Cool. Excellent. Well, I hope I can help as well. All right. Should we listen to some vocals? <laughs> I can only apologize. Singing is a long way down my list of skills. Um, but I enjoy doing it. It's a love-hate relationship. Uh, I love writing songs, love writing lyrics. I don't do it enough. YouTube takes up far too much of my time. Um, so hopefully with these live streams, I can kill two birds with one stone. Uh, now, these are these were demo vocals, so the, the, the phrasing and the delivery is a bit drummer. It's a bit regimented. I have worked on the phrasing since. I have done some recording since. Um, with a V47 microphone, which has got more low end in it, because as you can hear, this is towards the top end of my register in full projecting chest voice. So I lose some of the low end and some of the resonance, as you can hear. Um, and the V47 helps bring that back in. And I got the phrasing right, and my the tone of my voice was great on the day. Um, but I over-compressed everything. I was going through my WA-73 into my WA-76, which is an 1176-style FET compressor, very quick. And then into my WA-2A, LA-2A-style compressor, which is slower. And I just overdid the compression. And I'm really annoyed because the phrasing and the tone... I, I could play that in a bit, but I'm aware this is going to become a long session. So I might save that for another day. Uh, so what I've done with the vocals is a mild pitch correction. And these vocals aren't too bad, but let's face it, Everyone's used to perfectly in tune vocals. For the real recording in my vocal session, I would go in and I will tune the lead vocals. I mean, I'm not too proud to say that my voice needs tuning. Uh, it's a tool. I'm not the best singer in the world. Like I said, it's a long way down my skill list. So I will tune it um, because I think that's what people expect these days. Pop music is so heavily processed. Things that do sound on you know, out of tune, I think really pulls people ears, people's ears these days. Uh, obviously, there's a style, you know, stylistic choice to make with that, but I'm writing pop rock music, so I, I want things in tune. And then with the backing vocals, I will use Logic's Flex Pitch. I use Melodyne for the lead vocals because I genuinely think it sounds better, but it's fiddly as F and it's a, yeah, it's, it's a bit of a nightmare. Logic Flex Pitch is great because you can you get a piano roll and you can, on same, same as Melodyne, but I just find Flex Pitch a little bit easier. And if it doesn't sound as good as Melodyne, it doesn't matter because it's backing vocals and I can just do it quicker uh, in Logic Flex Pitch. So that's why I do, and there's more backing vocals and lead vocals, so it makes sense to be able to do those quicker. Um, in terms of the lead vocal, pitch correction, a DS. I've got a feeling that I'll need tweaking. Um, wow, yeah. Okay, so you can see I've tried to bring in loads of low end with the Pro Q there. Let's have a listen to it and then this will make sense. I saw an angel by my side With tears from heaven as she cried I saw a reflection in those eyes Like a ghost in the night while we were dancing So... I'm clearly taking out some nasally frequencies there. I do have a habit of, eh, well, I, I try to sing from the front using my mask, or at least I've definitely been focusing on that in the last few months since recording these. Um, the sound may be a bit far back in my voice at this point. Uh, so I needed some air at the top, a bit of nasally frequencies here, and yeah, to boost, to boost the low end, just to warm it up a bit, because like I said, that end of my register, you know, I'm singing way higher there than I am speaking now, as you can hear. So um, I needed to bring in some of that warmth, which the Pro Q does really well. And just a bit of a Marg EQ. This has got a sound, this uh, plug-in. It really does. Um, and I've added some air in there as well. So let's go to the buses. Sorry, questions? No. Um, first bus is... Probably a short reverb, yep. It's a really short reverb. Just, again, like the snare drum, just to give it a little bit of thickness, a little bit of weight. I saw an angel 
by my side. Might be a bit too much. With tears from heaven, as she cried, I saw reflection. But again, might be too much there, but let's listen to it in the mix because it might not. I saw an angel by my side with tears from heaven. Yeah, that'll do. Now you'll notice the significant drop in volume there. That's because I've got a parallel vocal bus going as well. Um, all right, next reverb along is a longer reverb, and I've used the Valhalla. This is amazing. Pre-delay. Uh, the, so normally with a long reverb, I would go for a long pre-delay. I haven't done because I've got another way around this, which is another video I've been meaning to do for about a year. And I think I'm going to do it for my mate, Rob, um, Rob McKellen's channel. He's, he runs Home Studio Simplified. If you don't know Home Studio Simplified, go and check him out. He does a, a monthly mix and I think a monthly songwriting competition, or he might alternate them month by month. But really good channel, and they go uh, well into analyzing songs and um, analyzing mixes. And it's a really helpful, positive community. If you're ever anxious about putting music out, go and speak to Rob and go and hang out on Rob's channel because you'll get so much encouragement. Um, so what I do here is on a on a bus send with the long reverbs, you'll notice none of these effects are on the channel strip because I use multiple channels to send to Multi to the same reverbs and effects. If I had to put all these on every single vocal channel that I wanted reverb on, I'd be using a lot of plugins and a lot of CPU and my computer would spaz out. So to get around that, just send multiple channels to the one bus. Um, and with the long reverb, what I've got, EQ, always EQ your uh, reverbs, your effects, take out the low end. You don't need, you know, 50 hertz rumble you know I, I probably don't project 50 hertz with my voice but if the mic's picked up you know a plane going over or something you don't need that 50 hertz rumbling with reverb amplifying that as well so filter all that stuff off same with the top and also with the reverb it can amplify sibilance so you've got to be careful with that as well with these parallel bus sends so re uh, eq your reverbs valhalla this thing just sounds great my favorite vocal plugin. Um, oh, I can't remember what I've done with that. Oh, that's a long reverb, 2.12 seconds. And then this is the key. So this is a compressor on the vocal bus, vocal reverb. So what this is doing is basically I've got a quite high ratio, quite a high threshold. Sometimes I'll have that higher actually. So what that's doing is instead of having the long reverb there all the time, let's bypass it and have a listen. What the compressor is doing is squashing the reverb down until the end of the vocal phrase, and then it's slowly allowing the, rev the, the long reverb to come up in the mix. So it's not getting in the way when the, you know, when, the, uh, when the words are coming out, but at the end of a phrase, it's coming up quite nicely. It's, it's a bit fiddly to tune your ears in to get this right, but let's have a listen and um, let me know if you can hear the difference. Marlon's here. Hey, man. Check out Marlon's channel as well. He's... He's the plug-in guy at the moment. <laughs> He's killing it. Hey, Marlon. So this is an impromptu live stream. Uh, I've just figured out my live stream set up today, and I thought, why not talk through a mix session because I need to finish this mix. Uh, so that's the essence of today. I'm really hungry, and I need to go home soon, so this won't be much longer. Uh, thanks for everyone who's tuned in, though. Uh, so the parallel reverb send, this is a long reverb. Let's take away the short reverb so it's really obvious without the compressor. I saw an angel by my side with tears from heaven as she cried. So you can hear it, it's all the time in the background. Now, what the compressor's doing, uh, the key point I should mention is that this is side-chained to the verse vocals um, down there. Not gonna change that. Um, so what it's gonna do is when the vocals are in, it's gonna squash this entire bus send. It's gonna squash everything before it down, including the reverb. And then at the end of the vocal phrase, it's gonna lift off. I've got a reasonably slow release. That's actually quite quick, relatively. Um, I'll, I'll play with this and exaggerate it so you can hear it on and off. I saw an angel by my side with tears from heaven as she cried. I saw reflection in those eyes, like a ghost in the night while we were dancing. 
So there, when I'd exaggerated the settings, it was quite obvious how it was really low and then came up at the end of the um, end of the section. Uh, that's too obvious because it then jumps out as if it's his own instrument. So uh, I'd have it somewhere around there. Again, the release. The release is tricky to get right, but when you do, it's cool. And then I wouldn't have it as loud as that um, in the mix anyway. I saw an angel by my side. So that's too With much. Tears from heaven. So for me there, the, the difference between it being off and on was too much. So uh, I've taken the threshold back so it's not squashing it down as much. I guess I could play with the ratio, but eight's just a number I've established that works quite well. I saw an angel by my side. With so there you can hear it coming out at the end. Uh, and I do this with delays and reverbs pretty much all the time except with the short reverb that I just leave out because that I want up front and present um, to make the vocals sound quite full. And there's a question. How much dB recorded signal is sufficient for vocals? Ooh, um, that's a bit of a how long is a piece of string question. Um, if we look at these audio file waves here, let's put that to zero. That was at minus 10 and turn all these off. I saw an angel by my side with tears from heaven. So that's coming in at minus 10.5 dB, which is a pretty good level up for vocals. You kind of want them forward anyway. I wouldn't want to go too much higher than that because you're eating into your headroom to mix. But I mean, if you know about the analog equipment days, they would suggest RMS of or an average of minus 18, peak of minus 12 because of the summing effect between analog um uh, with analog mixing, everything would add up together and get louder and louder. Uh, not so applicable with digital, but still a good practice. So minus 10 dB in your door. So instead of thinking about decibels, it's worth thinking how hard, if you have an external preamp, how hard do you want to saturate the sound? And that you've just got to go by ear. Um, and then how hard do you want to go into your door? I'd say anything around minus 10 is suitable. Um, lots of polarizing opinions on this though, but um, leave that to all the people to fight about because I have my process and other than that, I just don't care. Um, right, so vocals with everything in. Oh, that was it, the parallel send. So what have I done here? Uh, distress it again, six to one, just to really squash the signal. Uh, oh yeah, so I have gated uh, the parallel send. That's so, because what I'm doing there is squashing the life out of it. So all the all the breaths in between takes are going to be really amplified. This is an effort to try and reduce the breaths without curtailing any of the start of phrases. Um, that's a bit of a juggling act. You could automate this to get the same effect. For example, pressing A to get the automation up. Uh, I, I mean, if you listen... So the new Machine Gun Kelly album, if you listen to some of his tracks, there's no breaths in the verses on some of the tracks. It's just blah, 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 blah. And there's no blah, 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 blah. They've filtered it out because they've used the breaths almost as a dynamic variation as an instrument in, in itself. So in the big sections when he's going for it, you can hear the breaths, you can feel the passion in his voice with the big breaths he's taking. But in the quite subtle moments, he's taking them out, which is I only noticed the other day, but it's quite interesting. So what I could do is automate all the breaths out but to, oh, not like that, um, like that. But to me, yeah, it's a lot of work. I can't be bothered with it, and it's a little bit unnatural, isn't it? Um, but a DS on the parallel send would be useful. Now, I don't know why I've done it that way around. It would make sense to do it the other way around. Let's have a listen. And I've got an EQ as well. Again, taking out some of the top end because uh, the heavily compressed parallel send is going to have a lot of top end in if I've compressed it loads, taking out the bottom end, so it's not, actually that wouldn't, mm, so that would be fiddling. Let's play around with the order of these, because the EQ at the end, the compressor's already squashed the bottom end. What I should probably do is put these the other way around like that. Then the EQ is taken out the bottom end, so the compressor's only compressing the top end, and not so much of the top end, because I've taken that out as well. And then the gate is also gonna be taking the breaths out before the compressor is squashing them. But let's have a listen to how I had it before, because there would have been a reason for that. 
I saw an angel by my side with tears from heaven as she cried. So the gate's working really well there for pulling out the breaths in between. Um, but let's put them the other way around. And what the, the parallel stand is doing and the EQ is doing is really focusing in that mid range in the voice to give it some body and warmth when you combine it with the full vocal. Let's have a listen to it the other way around. I saw an angel by my side with tears from heaven. So there's a lot more sibilances in that. I think I prefer it the other way around. I saw an angel by my side with tears from heaven as she cried. I saw reflection in those eyes. Now, as a standalone vocal, you might be thinking, Ed, that sounds crap. What are you doing? Um, it is the parallel send, so it's, it's to complement the lead vocal. So if I go too heavy on the sibilance, it's going to be overbearing in the mix. Let's have a listen to it in the mix with the lead vocal. I saw an angel by my side With tears from heaven as she cried I saw reflection in the... And you can hear the long reverb um, compressor work in there. It's a bit subtle. Uh, I might do more work on that, and I'm definitely going to take that down because I think that's too much. But again, in the context of the full mix, it might be enough. Um, let's go for a, a verse. I saw an angel by my side With tears from heaven as she cried I saw reflection in those eyes Like a ghost in the night while we were dancing And uh, what have I done in the chorus? Probably copy and pasted the settings. So uh, that's what I have done. The chorus I've done, a, a, I've used a different reverb I've gone to another bus send and I have assigned the compressor to the lead vocals on the chorus, chorus vocal rather than verse vocal. Um, otherwise, the compressor wouldn't do anything and it would just come out full blast, loads of reverb. Right, so that's how I have set up this session. Uh, I, I think I'll do some more live streams. What do you think? Give me a thumbs up. Give the video a thumbs up if you've liked this, uh, my first proper live stream now that I've got set up with OBS and my routing with my universal audio stuff, which wasn't quite as straightforward as I thought. Uh, yeah, let me know if this is something you'd like to see more of because I'm tempted to go into this track in proper detail and mix, as I mix it properly. I still need to record the lead vocals, um, so it might be a, a couple of weeks away yet. But yeah, if you're interested in this kind of these kind of videos, let me know. Thank you for watching. Thanks for sticking around. Uh, give me a hands up as well if you've watched the whole thing, uh, and I'll definitely owe you a pint at some point. Uh, right, enjoy your evening. I need to walk home and get some dinner. Uh, it's been a pleasure. It's been emotional, um, and I'll talk to you soon. And I'm going to say goodbye. Adios. Thanks for watching. See you soon, guys. Stay safe. Look after yourselves, and I'll see you on the next one.